everyone, and welcome back to Fiber, Floss, and Fiction. This is a podcast where I talk about my knitting, hand spinning, um, cross stitch projects, and what I'm reading. So today is September 15th, 2022. My name is Anne, and I'm coming to you from the mountains of northern New Mexico today, where it is definitely feeling more like fall. Um, we had temperatures in the upper 40s this morning when I got up, which felt great to be able to like pull on a sweatshirt. So hope things are well where you are. Um, if you uh, have visited with me in other podcasts, today will be a similar format. Um, we're going to talk about things in that order of knitting and hand spinning, books in the middle, and then cross stitch at the end. I've got a few the viewer requests that I will do at the end to talk about this project right here, um, as well as some pony things, pictures right there. Um, there will, as always, be timestamps uh, down below so you can skip to parts you're interested in, or you can look for the little slides that mark each of those divisions of things of interest. So I do have quite a bit to talk to you about. I'm going to try to get through this on my lunch break today. And so let's jump right on in and we'll talk some knitting. Uh, I have two finished objects to share. The first one is this great hat. This is the Stars Hollow Hat. Um, and everything that I talk about, projects, patterns, book titles, will all be in the information box down below. Uh, so this is the Stars Hollow Hat, uh, designed by Vanessa Smith, and it is a DK weight hat that is super, super stretchy. And you can see it has a really fun uh, slip stitch pattern on it, and then the little crosses on it are highlighted with some pearl beads. Um, I used one skein of my hand spun. It is a blue face Lester hand spun in the colorway Eowyn. So it's got some kind of dark mauves and uh, some lighter rose and taupe in it. And uh, I knit the larger size because I was a little concerned since my hand spun was kind of a light DK, headed more towards sport, um, that it might not be big enough if I didn't. It probably would have been fine to have knit the small size, but as stretchy as it is, I think it will fit a multitude of heads, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, I used size six seed beads, which are kind of a just a pearl color there, um, and applied those with a small crochet hook. It's not a super hard technique, it's just a little bit fiddly. Um, if you haven't worked with beads before and you'd be interested in having me do a little tutorial on how to do that, just let me know and I'll be glad to film, film that. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can apply beads. Um, the pattern talks about using a small crochet hook, but it also talks about using like fishing line um, or you can use dental floss or really thin wire. Um, has a nice wide ribbed brim so you can wear it as a slouch or you can fold the brim up and wear it more like a beanie. So I think it came out really, really cute. Uh, it is going to go into the um, box that my mom uh, and her church ladies put together where they uh, do like gift bags for their local homeless shelter where they try to do, I think it's a hat, a pair of socks, and then some personal toiletries and a gift card or gift certificate, that kind of thing um, for the colder months which are coming up. So yeah, a great one skein project. Um, I think it would work with a lot of different yarns. It'd be super pretty in, in a plain color with kind of bright colored beads on it or I think it would be just fine with like a hand paint or some other brightly colored yarn. So that one is finished and then I finished up the pair of um, Desert Vista Dye Works self-striping sock yarn socks in the colorway Puffin and I used a mm, I modified a pattern sock pattern called Espresso Macchiato Socks by C.C. Allman. And um, you can see 
that just gives it this nice little eyelet rib, um, eyelet garter stitch row texture. Uh, the pattern is written from toe up and I actually cast on and knit it this way. It's pretty easy to mm, change. Um, and I opted to, the pattern has you pick uh, which of the self striping sock yarn stripes you want to add the eyelets to. So I just picked orange because I thought that would be fun and they're sort of little round jack-o'-lanterns. Um, the other modification I made was to make a fish lips kiss heel, uh, which I did just in plain black. And I really like how these came out. Um, yes, they are themed on the puffins, the seabird, but I think they look extremely Halloween-ish and uh, very bright and cheery. And I used my kind of standard 64 stitch circumference for these. Um, I can't remember if the pattern has two sizes or three. I think it may have three. But at any rate, 66 or 64 stitches is what I would normally have used if I was just knitting plain striped socks. So that's what I did and then threw in this little detail from CC's pattern. So really like those. Those will also probably go into the donation box. Um, so that's it for finished objects this go round. I am currently working on another pair of socks. These are, and this is the first one, I just cast on the second one last night. These are the Brighton socks by the designer Rachel Coopy. I think that's how she says her last name, or Coupe. Coopy? Anyway. Uh, she is Coop Knits on the world of social media and a color work pattern, which I love. I think that came out super fun. Um, I am using West Yorkshire Spinners 4-ply, so it's a sock or fingering weight yarn. Um, the colors are Dusty Miller, which is this gray, uh, Black Current Bomb, which is this brighter, almost fuchsia pink, and then... Amethyst is the purple, the dark purple. So I had, I've had these on my um, queue for quite a while and had wanted to knit them and I'm not really even sure why I hadn't because honestly I love to knit color work. These are color work socks. I love to knit socks. I, I don't know. I just had put off ever casting them on and I honestly don't know why I did because I love how they're coming out and they are super fun to knit. Um, the pattern comes with two sizes, uh, two, I should say two leg length sizes. This is the short version and then there's a knee high version. And it comes with three foot circumference sizes, foot and leg circumference sizes. And I'm knitting the middle one, which is normally more stitches around than I would, would for like a plain sock. Um, but I understand that when you're doing color work, you need the extra stitches, A, to make the pattern work out evenly, but also uh, color work tends to pull in. So you want it snug, but not tight. So I'm using the called for stitch count and I went up a needle size. I normally knit my socks on US 1s, the 2.25 millimeter version. And so I, I used that for the plain stockinette part. And then I used a US 2s, which is 2.75 millimeter for the color work. And it worked out perfectly. They fit just, just right. What I did do, though, is when I got to the foot, she does have you uh, rearrange some stitches to start the heel flap. And so you have a little bit, you have one less stitch on the front. And so what I did is I, I went ahead and did that, reorganized the stitches, I worked the heel flap, and then as I was working the gusset, I actually decreased a couple of extra stitches. So I wound up with two stitches less on the underside of the foot as I had on the top side of the foot. Hopefully this is making sense. And then when I went to do the toes, so I had to graft the toe together here at the tip, so I would have an even number of stitches on both of those. I just moved one stitch from the sole needle up to the top of the foot needle. So it shrunk the circumference down a little bit and then it fit, it fit just fine. 
Um, so second one is cast on. I've worked through there. So I've got that much of the second one done. And hopefully we'll have the second one to show you next time we're visiting together. And then the final project that I have currently on the needles is my terrain scarf. This is a pattern by Janina Calio, who is Woolenberry on social media and Ravelry. And um, I have decided, I decided to work this pattern with a set of five mini skeins in these like dark purpley grays. Um, the pattern doesn't call for that, so this is just me doing this because I wanted to use up these minis. Uh, the minis are from Dragon Horde Yarn, and they were from her Dark Crystal box. Um, and my pattern, my pattern, no, project page on Ravelry has the specific colorways, although I don't think, I don't think there are ones that Tristan, like, has duplicated outside of that box, so may not be super helpful for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so all I did was I started knitting it, knitting this. And when I was getting to the end of where my first color was getting close to running out, I opted to start alternating every other row. So I did, you know, two rows in this first color. Then I did two rows in what was going to be the next color, two rows in the first color, two rows in the new color, two rows in the older color. And then I switched to the new, the new color to work all of that. So you can see there's one, two, three, and four colors. Um, so I just have the fifth color that I'm going to be ready to start. And when I'm here, I'm ready to start adding that in. Um, this is much more complex looking than it actually is to work. It's, it's really not a difficult pattern. It's knit, knits, pearls, a yarn over, a slip slip knit and knit two together. That's all that creates this. And the really neat part about it, especially I think you can see it in this section, is these sections look way darker and all they are is plain stockinette, meaning that there's they're just flat stitches and not the bumpier garter stitch. But they look totally different. They are really, really sculptural, I think. So um, coming to the end of this one, I should have it done by the next time we talk as well. It's a very fast knit. Um, once you kind of get the pattern set up, after the second repeat, I haven't had to really look at the pattern at all because you just keep repeating it and you can count your rows really easily because it's garter stitch. So I should have that to show you next time as well. And then my final thing I wanted to mention was starting today, um, Earth Tone, Earth Tones Girl uh, over on social media, uh, she also has a podcast, is hosting a fall, hang on, let me get the exact name of it, but it's a fall sock knit along. And did I write it down in here? No, I did not. I will put the link uh, the information below for the hashtag for the knit along, but it's basically knit fall socks and it starts today, September 15th, and it runs through November 15th. And the idea is to try to knit one pair of socks for each of the months, basically one for September to October and one for October to November and to pick colors that remind you of fall. So I am going to be using this skein of sock yarn which has all kinds of like pumpkin orange and a really dark cranberry red and some spruce green and some lighter kind of mm, butter yellow colors in it um, and it is fiber stash dye works it is their twinkle toes sock and it is in the color hayride it's a 75% superwash merino, 20% nylon, and 5% sparkle base. 
which was sent to me by a podcast viewer. I don't know if she still watches my podcast, but from way back when I was recording more frequently. Um, so thank you for this because I have wanted to um, knit something with it. It's been in stash far too long and I love the colors. So probably just going to do a very plain sock. Uh, I think just plain vanilla so the colors can kind of sing and that will make me happy to have on my feet. So uh, look for that to get started next time I see you. Um, I think that's it for knitting. I'm trying to keep this a little bit shorter because I know the last two have been a whole hour, but um, I think that's going to do us for knitting today. So let's go on and talk about books. In books over the last couple of weeks, I have three finished books that I was going to talk to you about today and two more that I've started. So let's see. Uh, the first one I wanted to talk about is called The Curse of Billy the Kid. I got this uh, as an ebook, so I don't have the print copy to show you. The author is Tamsin Silver, and this is a combination of uh, historical fiction based on Billy the Kid and uh, the regulators here in New Mexico after the Civil War, and fantasy, some of which is Native American mythology and some of which is Celtic mythology. So it's kind of a unique combination of topics and things. Um, the story follows Billy the Kid and members of, I won't call it his gang, but the regulators who are involved in this land war here in New Mexico, out in the eastern part of the state, closer to Texas. And it goes through the sort of rival gangs, interactions and shoot 'em ups and kind of the things that you know about Billy the Kid, uh, if you follow Western history at all. And then into the mix comes uh, an element that is fantasy as well as sort of supernatural. Uh, the author ties in werewolves. She ties in um, Native American shapeshifters uh, as well as, I'm going to say, I'm going to call it a Native American goddess, but I don't think this goddess is associated with a specific tribe or a specific area. I think it's made up for, for the book. Um, and then a sort of witch figure from Celtic mythology. So I really enjoyed the parts of this book that kind of went into the history that talk about Lincoln County, the Lincoln County Wars, things to do with the actual historic points. Um, I, I should say this book is the first in a trilogy and it is one of my pet peeves when a book ends on a cliffhanger, like you can't, you're in the middle of a ton of different pl plot lines and sort of action, and then it just stops. I feel like either if you have enough fodder for a trilogy, then write three books that are interrelated, but that can be read separately and still make sense, or edit stuff down and put it all in one book. That's just my personal opinion, so your mileage may vary. The other thing that I didn't love about this book was it felt to me kind of disjointed where I understood the historic fiction of it, and I think I would have even been okay with having the Native American uh, shapeshifters and possibly some of that sort of medicine woman, for lack of a better term, uh, goddess myth mixed in with it. I, I think I could have wrapped my head around all of that. The addition of the Celtic aspect just just felt extra to me. Um, so I, I struggled with this book. Um, I probably will not read more in the series. I just didn't love it that much. And um, I might look at the author. She has another uh, set of books that are 
exclusively Celtic myth based. So I might look at those because I did enjoy her character development um, and bonus points for this great. My, one of my favorite characters in the book is a horse and his name is Colonel and I really liked him. So um, I'll give points for that. But overall, it just wasn't my cup of tea. So if you love that kind of shoot 'em up book that also has a whole bunch of different um, mythic stories intertwined with it, it might be something that you would love. So just giving my personal review on it. Uh, the next book that I wanted to talk about is A Darker Shade of Magic, which is by V.E. Schwab or Victoria Schwab, who over the last year, year and a half, has become one of my favorite authors. Um, I love the fact that her books are a little bit melancholy and um, she writes really great like adventure, uh, I'm going to say battle scenes, they're not really battle scenes, um, fight scenes. Everything has a little touch of magic in it. Um, she does a great job, in my opinion, of getting you immersed into the character's world so deeply that you are willing to let her take you on whatever ride she might choose to take you on. Uh, two of my favorite books in the last year have been um, Addie LaRue and Gallant, both of which are hers. They're completely separate universes and different books. A Darker Shade of Magic is the first in a series. Um, I am giving points for the fact that this one did not end on a cliffhanger. There is definitely the door is open for more stuff to happen in books two and three, which I am sure I will read. But it doesn't leave you like with a sort of aftertaste in your mouth about what just happened. And then you don't have the next book to go to. Um, the main premise of the book is that there are four Londons and each of the cities is interconnected um, and only certain people can travel between them, people who still have magic. So there's Red London, Grey London and White London that are still active that you can still go in and out of. And then there's Black London, which had black magic and the door was shut centuries ago. Um, White London has two um, very powerful mages who sit on the throne and their court magician um, is also very powerful. White London is a little bit bleak. The pressure of withstanding the evil forces from Black London had kind of sapped some of the life out of it. Red London is the London our main, the main magician character lives in, uh, Kel, and it is beautiful and vibrant and everything kind of smells like flowers and it's a magical place in a good way. And then there's Grey London, which is kind of the London that we know from history. Uh, the book ostensibly is set in the mid 19th, yeah, no, late 18th into 19th century, if you're going by the kings who are on the throne in Grey London, which is George III and then the Prince Regent. So Kel as a magician functions as kind of a diplomat where he goes to the different courts and he represents the king and queen of Red London. And Kel has a bad habit of picking up things from the mundane world of Grey London and smuggling them back into Red London and taking little magical toys from Red London into Grey London where he kind of sells them on the black market. Um, the main character in Grey London is this young woman who um, wants to be a pirate, I guess is how I would describe it. Um, Lila has been saving up for her own ship. Um, she's kind of a petty thief and um, doesn't really have a landing place. She's, you know, rents a room, um, thieves at night, is saving up her money to buy a ship. So she winds up running into Kel literally on the street. Um, and he's been attacked that she figures out kind of who he is. Um, 
and there is a a meeting that happens where someone slips an artifact from Black London into Kel's pocket and he has to figure out how to get rid of it because it's the source of all of this very, very powerful Black magic. And the two of them join forces. So it's a young adult-ish type fantasy. I would, I would say it's probably suitable for late teens and up. Um, there is some violence in it, not necessarily super gratuitous, but there is some um, and the characters so far in book one have a fairly pl platonic relationship. So I really enjoyed this one, maybe not as much as the other two books that I mentioned um, at, at the beginning of this discussion on the Ishwab, um, but enough that I will definitely read books two and three in this series. Again, she does just a great job of character creation and world building. Um, the only thing that I kind of have a criticism about with this book is maybe three quarters, seven eighths of the way through. Um, and I should mention, I listened to this on an audiobook, which was excellent. The uh, narrator was very good. Um, there's a little detail about Lila and something that has happened to her in the past. I don't want to give any spoilers away um, that kind of comes up and it's like no one has ever noticed this before, and then it's mentioned. And it seemed a little bit too convenient because I'm sure it will have repercussions in the later books. So that part of it um, was a little ham-handed, I guess, but I'm willing to go there. I thought it was, you know, a lot of fun. Um, and it's one of the books from her back catalog. It's not one of her newer ones. So all three in the trilogy are out and I think are available at a lot of libraries if you decide you want to give it a try. And then the last book I wanted to talk about today um, is uh, Cassie Clare's City of Ashes, which is the second book in her Shadowhunters trilogy. These have been out for a while. If you are a Cassie Clare fan, you probably have already read them. I'm doing these as a buddy read with a friend who had not yet read them, and I read them when they maybe not first first came out, but pretty close to their publication dates. So uh, it's been a while since I read them and this was a great excuse to revisit them. Um, I got as a birthday gift, not this year, but last year, uh, the box set. Um, this is from Litjoy. It's a special edition set. And what I love about the book, um, aside from the amazing artwork, that's in it is um, it's an annotated copy. So there's margin notes from the author that talk about the scene that she's written. And, you know, some of them are just like, this is the, this is based on a club that I went to while I was writing this book, or um, this one is just a brief note on some research she did on fairies and the fae court that gets pulled into this narrative. Um, and then these also have, I don't think these are included, or at least this wasn't included in the versions I read. Um, she, they have an end, uh, an extra set of end pages um, that are theoretically pages from the books that talk about the Shadowhunters world. So this one has a bestiaire in it that talks about downworlders. Um, vampires and the werewolves, the lycanthropes. Um, this one has a whole bunch of pages on d the different types of demons that are in the Shadowhunters world. So uh, again, this is book two in the Shadowhunters series. So this one follows um, Clary primarily, but it also brings in her friend Simon, who we met in book one, um, Jace and Isabel and Alec who are other shadow hunters we met in book one as well. And then um, Luke, who is Clary's kind of adopted father. And um, uh, and now I'm blocking the warlock's name. Magnus. Um, Magnus, who's the kind of main warlock in the city of New York. 
So if you've read the Shadowhunters books, you know what I'm talking about. If not, young adult fantasy, great fun, lots of good battle sequences, late teen people out slaying demons in the world. So I mean, what's not to love? It's escapism literature, which I am all about. Um, and then currently I have two books on the go. Uh, I'm still listening to Frog Music, although I'm almost finished with that audiobook, which is a historical fiction, and I will review that next time. And then I started a book called Killers of the Flower Moon. This is a nonfiction book, really interesting, that my friend Katie sent me a copy of after she had read it and thought I would like it, which she was right about. Um, it talks about a series of murders that occurred in Oklahoma in the 20s. Uh, among members of the Osage tribe who owned uh, the land under which one of the largest oil reserves in the world, but definitely in the United States. So they owned the drilling rights there. And so they were some of the richest people in the country, but not a class that was being supported by pretty much anybody. Let's just say that. Uh, I mean, they had money to do things with, but they were still uh, the victims of a lot of racism and just incomprehensible things that the white people did to control their money. Anyway, I will talk more about that, but it also ties in the growth of the FBI because the FBI was called in to investigate those murders. And then when they figured out who did it, wound up, um, kind of setting some of the l legal, boundaries of what the FBI could do and how they could try people and where they could try people, meaning the states versus federal courts. So more to come on those. Um, we'll talk about those next time we are together and we'll move on and talk cross stitch next. And last but not least, let's talk about some cross stitching. I am still working on my um, desert mandala. And last time we talked, I had mentioned this is done and I've worked my way across. I have, it's hard to see because it's rolled up here, but everything is finished across the bottom, including the braided border. And so I hopped up here um, because I had a little bit of the border to bring across where it, there's a matching triangular shaped motif here and I needed to bring down that border here. So I've been working to get these two to meet. And then I've also started this um, diamond shaped border. That will be the last corner I need to get completed with the borders. Um, I also worked this little motif. You can see the matching one on that side. So I've got that almost done. I need to do a little bit of back stitching and those last couple of missing stitches there. So this is definitely coming along. Um, everything did meet up correctly over here, which I think I mentioned last time and was kind of a relief because on this size of a project, you just, you just sometimes hope for the best. Um, so my plan for the rest of the month is to finish this outer border, get these two to meet up, of the braid and then that is completely done. The outer border will be totally done. And I'm going to also finish this diamond border which doesn't take too long. It has less color changes so it's not quite as commando. And I'm also gonna get the beading done in this section. Uh, these are all small beads so get those done and obviously finish these like six stitches I have left. The color that's in here is one of the colors that is in the two motifs right there. So when I start a new thread, I'll just add that in. Um, from there, my next thing to do is to work on these feathers. So there'll be a feather here and one over here to match that up. Um, I think I mentioned a while back, I'm low on the color, this kind of pale cream color of the hand dyed silk. And I want to make sure that I have enough to get the, the two feathers done here so that everything matches. 
this landscape has some of that same color in it, but I can replace it with like either a blended DMC color or just straight DMC color. There is a conversion in the pattern that would let me do that pretty easily. So um, I think then once I get the two feathers done, I am going to tackle the matching cactuses, cacti, here and get that kind of frame done. And then that will leave me the Roadrunner motif that goes on that side and then this landscape. So still a ways to go. And I am just plugging away at this, um, you know, trying to do some every day, but it's certainly not a quick stitch, which is fine. Um, but inching, inching towards that, that finish, um, getting there. So that is my current desert mandala progress and kind of where I am on that, on that particular project. Um, going forward, so I was talking to my friend Victor, just messaging back and forth about next year's plans. And I think next year is going to wind up being all full coverage. And I'm going to try to pick one of my projects that... I am further along on than some of my others. I have six full coverage projects on the go right now. A couple are minis, a couple are kind of medium sized ones, and then I have my really big Amy Stewart uh, shelves. I have a stitching shelf and I have the fairy tale, fairy tale shelf. The sti a stitching shelf is just the regular chart. Fairy tale is the super size max color. Um, so my thought for those was, um, next time I record, I'm going to pull those out, do kind of a show and tell of what I've got. And then I'm hoping that you all can help me pick which of those projects that I have closer to being finished, um, should be my focus project for 2023. And then everything else I'll do on a rotation to just get a little bit of work in on everything next year to kind of move them forward. Um, but Victor and I have decided that we're going to do a two week, like focus project knit along. So that'll be whatever, or stitch along, whatever it is I decide that I want to get finished. And then there will be the other projects that will get added in that I'll work on in rotation for the other two weeks of every month in 2023. So I think that'll be fun. Um, and then I'd love to hear what you all think, kind of which one you can help me choose to get finished. Um, I was kind of leaning towards a couple of the minis or one of the minis that I've got going just because those are closer to being finished and realistically would get finished next year. But a stitching shelf is my oldest project ever. It's the first thing I started when I got back into cross stitching and, you know, it's big. I've just started the second tier section of shelves. Uh, so it's probably not something I would get done next year, but if I had it as a focus piece, obviously would make more progress on it. So you all can think about that in the time between now and next time I record and let me know what you think. So, so I did have a viewer who asked if I would show the piece that's normally hanging on the wall over there. Um, this is my Joan Elliott Celtic wheel, which I stitched, I finished up two years ago now, I think it is. Uh, the fabric that I used is a 28 count even weave called Pirate Gold, Pirate's Gold, Pirate Gold, I think it's Pirate's Gold, uh, from Color and Cotton. And then I use the DMC uh, that was called for. So it's the Celtic Wheel of the Year, and it features the eight sabots in it. You can see those around. Um, where am I looking at? Uh, starting with Samhain, and then going through Yule and the rest of the year. Um, lots of back stitching in this piece, so like be prepared for that if you decide to tackle it. I don't think it is available. Pretty sure it's not available as a PDF. I think it's only in the print book 
bewitching cross stitch, which has a lot of other good patterns in it. So if you like, if you like her designs, it's probably worth seeing if you can find a copy either on Amazon or maybe used on eBay. Um, I don't think it's super, super pricey, but um, I think it may be out of print. So um, framed this myself with the dark blue um, kind of suede texture mat, and then this gold frame. Really loved working on this, and I love the detail in each of the flowers. Let's see if I can do this without too much glare. My favorite are those little snowdrops for in bulk. Love those. So, yeah. One of my favorite pieces, and I love that I have it on my wall to look at while I'm here in my office at work. At home. In my office in which I work. At home. And so the last little bit is not craft related, but... For those of you who may, might have interest in horsey things, um, I'm just going to talk briefly about those because if you were asked some questions about the photos I had hanging behind me. So if you're just here for crafts and books, thank you for watching and I will see you next time, probably in about two weeks. Um, might be a little bit longer because we've got a short vacation planned, so we'll see how that goes for recording. But thank you for watching um, and commenting liking, subscribing, all that good stuff. Um, and if you're here for the horses, let's let's talk those. Uh, so these are the horses that we got when we first moved out west. Um, we were in Vermont, and my husband said, you know, when we move out west, where he was taking a postdoc position um, to continue his education, he was like, we could get horses. And I had grown up with horses uh, and ri riding them, but he had not. So he was a very brave person to volunteer for that. Um, so I knew for sure I wanted a little gelding and I went shopping and found my boy Digger. Um, he was just three when I got him. He, I think was not quite five in this picture. It was the winter before he turned five. Um, he was a very interesting little horse. He was a Missouri Fox Trotter, which if you have horses, they are gated horses, kind of like Tennessee walkers. So they, they can trot, but they don't normally trot. They have other gates, um, which are very smooth and easy to ride. Um, he was a little tiny guy. He actually was one of a set of twins and they, they had both of them survive. Um, as well as his mom, who we wound up also purchasing for my husband. Um, when we went up to interview Digger in Idaho, um, we asked if the breeder had any other horses and they uh, had his mom actually for sale. Um, her name was Happy Hours. And uh, my husband just fell in love with her and nothing would do. I could not talk him out of getting a mare. Um, when I was a kid, the only difficult horse we had in our stable, and this included an off-the-track thoroughbred stallion who remained uncut, um, meaning he kept all of his working parts, um, was a mare, and she was total hell on wheels. Um, <sighs> Happy was a very nice horse. She was extremely well-trained. Part of the thing that we found out about her is that when she... Um, had her monthly cycles, she was throwing multiple eggs and it made her very, very, very uncomfortable to the point that if you tried to get on her at the right part of her cycle, she would just launch you. And I get it, right? Your back hurts, everything hurts. You just do not want to be messed with, but that's not really safe for a riding horse and not super safe for a beginner rider. She was great when she was not having that issue, um, and yeah, I would have put anybody on her. So she was a slightly difficult horse to manage in that we had to just be very careful about the calendar and not asking her to do things certain times of the month. I mean, she just was in too much discomfort. We um, tried some different things with her, but um, ultimately it was better just not to ride her on those weekends. 
Digger, um, because he had been a twin, had been bottle fed and so did not have a lot of personal space concept. Um, <clears throat> he was definitely an in your pocket horse. Sometimes you would have to beat him off with a stick because he was way in your pocket. Um, really, really great head on his shoulders. I, I mean, even from when he was young and not very savvy about the world, I could trust him to take care of things and make smart choices. And I absolutely loved riding him. He was really a one person horse. He did not do well, like he wouldn't have been a good lesson horse. He did not do well with switching riders. Um, you know, and the good news for him was he's, he was pretty, pretty small. Um, we actually could have, I, I'm only five, four. So, you know, I'm, I'm basically taller than he is in this picture. Um, he, uh, he did not like to have other people ride him, which was fine because, you know, he had kind of a limited size person who could ride him. Um, anyway, I did everything on him. We moved cows. We trail rode. We, did, we just did all kinds of things. He was a really great horse. The one thing that he was not suited for was endurance riding. And when I got into endurance riding, he really languished and was unhappy not being my number one horse anymore. Um, and I wound up uh, selling him to a woman, an older woman who had retired from endurance riding, and she just wanted a horse to work her mini farm on. So he got to move cows. He got to go out on trail rides with her. He got to do something different every single day. And he loved that. He really, he was her only horse. Um, she had other horses that she owned, but that were like her husband's riding horse. She, he and she had a great partnership um, once he left me. And then my other horse uh, was my buddy, Ben. Ben is an Arabian, was an Arabian. Um, despite the fact that he did not look particularly Arabian, he was a papered Arabian. Um, his father is the horse who played the Black Stallion in the Black, the second Black Stallion movie. Um, also small because I do not like to have to find a rock to climb up on horses to get my, on my horse. Um, and this was Ben's job. All Ben wanted to do was go forward and have snacks. So he was a fantastic endurance horse for that reason. Um, this is our first ride together. We rode a, a really fun ride in uh, the area around Moab. Um, just great, great fun. Um, my friend MJ and I went down and rode this together. And that was Ben. He always liked looking ahead. His ears were up. He was just super relaxed and he'd go down the trail. He had one of the nicest long trots that I've ever ridden. And I don't know that he was, I mean, he's not a horse I would have had as a lesson horse because he was very forward, meaning he liked to go forward. That was his, I mean, that was his job. So awesome that that was what he liked to do. Um, but he was easy. He didn't, he was, he was fine not to be the driver. He liked to just be told where to go and trot on down the road and he knew what his job was and you could trailer him anywhere, you could camp with him anywhere. Um, really, really bomb proof. We actually were riding up on a Mesa here uh, on a training ride in New Mexico and we had one of the uh, Apache helicopters come up out of the Rio Grande Gorge, um, not very far from where we were. We heard the noise, but neither of us could figure out what it was. We thought it was like a, a like, ATV or something it turned out to be the helicopter coming up out of the gorge. And, you know, he didn't panic. He didn't do anything funky. He just kind of stepped a little bit to the side and kept trotting, didn't speed up, just was going his usual, just solid basic trot. So, um, Ben was 15 when we found out that he had lost most of his eyesight. I actually had been, been riding him, but we had one one ride where I was like, he's a little off. I just don't know what's what's up with him. And when the vet came and actually looked at his eyes, he had lost all of his vision in one eye and just had peripheral movement. 
on the one side. So we retired him, obviously. I mean, I don't know how long I had been riding him where he couldn't see and had been perfectly fine, but you just never know, right? I mean, I wouldn't have wanted anything bad to have happened to him, but retirement was not good for Ben. Um, he lasted about nine months after retired. We retired him and colicked and we had to put him down. So uh, one of the best horses I've ever had, actually, both he and Digger. I would gladly have horses like them. They were completely different personalities, but I would gladly have horses like them again in the future because they were each in their own way a delight and good friends. So miss them both every day and Maybe if hay was not quite so expensive here in the high desert, we would have horses again at some point, but um, at least for right now, we're on a break. So um, that's it for horsey things. If you have questions about that, please ask. I'm always happy to talk horses. So if you've stuck with me this far, thank you so much for watching. And like I said, be back two-ish weeks or so. Um, so until then, I hope everybody has a great start to their fall or spring season, depending on where you are in the world, um, and are just enjoying all of the things crafty and otherwise that life has to offer right now. So take care, everybody, and I will talk to you soon. Bye for now.